Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. My name is Sophia Ahmed. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Marilee Brockway, uh, who is an assistant prof of nursing here at the University of Calgary since September of 2022. Uh, Dr. Brockway completed her PhD in breastfeeding uh, self-efficacy here at the University of Calgary, followed by a three-year postdoctoral fellow, uh, scholarship fellowship at the University of Manitoba on human milk consumption. Uh, currently, she leads a program of research in providing donor human milk to mothers of full-time infants and examining maternal experiences and infant clinical outcomes. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Brockway so she can begin her presentation. Um, I do want to just comment before I do that in terms of intersectionality of uh, that uh, we recognize uh, our seminar is focused on women and we want to take a moment to recognize that women are not a homogeneous group. Uh, we use the term women to, uh, co to cover all of those who identify as women while simultaneously recognizing that many intersectional factors uh, also play a role in terms of determining our health outcomes and identities. So with that, thank you very much, Dr. Brockway. Thank you. Lauren, the slides are on here. Can everyone hear us okay? Can you give us a thumbs up because we lost that before? Is anyone able to hear us? Can you put yes in the chat? Yeah, there we go. We're getting thumbs up. Thank you very much, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sophia. Um, I just want to let you know that I do have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, I'm talking to you without any um, funding influencing what I'm saying. I also want to take a moment to do our territorial land acknowledgement, being physically here in Calgary. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, and also to acknowledge that the city of Calgary is home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And I always like to include a little bit of artwork from local uh, artists who are Indigenous, and this is uh, a piece called Life Giver from Autumn White Way here in Calgary. I also feel it's pertinent to provide a positionality statement when I'm in these spaces and we're talking about uh, intersectionality and where I'm coming from as far as my own lived experience, especially in the realm of infant feeding. So I am a registered nurse. I have a PhD in nursing as well. My nursing practice was in postpartum and public health. I also have my international board certified lactation consulting um, certific certification. So that really means I have a lot of practical knowledge around human milk, lactation, and breastfeeding. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work in the research space around breastfeeding and human lactation, around human milk composition, donor human milk supplementation. I also work in the infant microbiome and then around maternal outcomes with breastfeeding self-efficacy, maternal mood, and agency. And then to add to that, I'm also a mother. So I have my own personal infant feeding experiences uh, times three. Each one was uh, very different from the other. I also identify as a heteronormative white female, um, but I do really strive to achieve intersectional feminism in my practice and in my work. So what I wanna go over today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about highlighting opposing feminist viewpoints on infant feeding and breast and chest feeding discourse. I want to demonstrate how infant feeding discourse has been driven by concepts founded in the patriarchy, discuss how research has been conducted from a positivist or post-positivist, which is also kind of known as a biomedical or scientific model, and then present the need for an intersectional feminist lens to move forward with the provision of care and research in the infant feeding space. So I just want everyone to take a minute and look at this word and take some time to acknowledge your gut reaction when you hear the word breastfeed. There's many of us out there that probably have our own personal experiences with breastfeeding um, and infant feeding. And those experiences definitely influence how we view uh, breastfeeding. So some may have warm fuzzies when they think about this word. Some may experience cold prick pricklies, anger, trauma. 
Um, we all have different experiences with this, even if we haven't fed a child ourselves, if we have a partner who's fed a child, if we have a good friend or a sister, um, we do come to this space with our own preconceived notions and experiences. And it's really important for us to acknowledge those as we work in this space and work with other uh, breastfeeding or chest feeding parents. So I wanna give you a quick background on philosophy and some of the terms that I will be using today. So positivism and post-positivism are the philosophical backgrounds for the scientific method. And really what they embrace is that there's a single observable re reality. There's one truth or probable truth out there that we can discover with scientific method. And in doing so, we can produce laws and make these laws generalizable to others. We really embrace the objective using this philosophy. So um, something is the same for everybody that experiences it. And we really ignore subjectivity when we use the scientific method. So there's little to no personal interpretation of the data. We often use very structured methodologies so that we can um, replicate them. We can analyze them using statistics. And honestly, this is pretty much how we've built most of our knowledge and evidence within the scientific context and within the infant feeding space. But when we take a feminist lens to this, um, we need to, we can come up with some critiques. These were mainly uh, posted by Basu in 2020, that positivism was originated from a bourgeoisie philosophy. So it was developed by the white elite uh, on the backdrop of the industrial revolution. It's driven predominantly by the white male um, lens. It's grounded in colonialism. So it really uh, embraces the Western paradigm and it tends to ignore subjectivity. And subjectivity when we're working with humans is one of the most significant elements of knowledge creation. And it can enhance our knowledge and complement other uh, methods such as the scientific method to increase a broader spans of understanding. Uh, it's important for knowledge or to account for subjectivity to create a holistic knowledge. And really positivism and post-positivism is centered around the white male heteronormative elitism and ableism of the dominant power or hegemony. Um, and it's really come through uh, embracing that patriarchal theory. So just um, some basic background on that. Sophia already did an excellent job talking about intersectionality and intersectional feminism, but I see this as a really nice way to study real world phenomena. Um, it really thinks about structural, political, and representational um, ways of interacting and how they uh, enforce or influence a human's experience. They all, it also looks at how systems of oppression overlap. Uh, it's important to consider one's social position within those systems of oppression and how they um, experience certain life experiences or interventions or uh, medical interactions. And it may function less as a research method, but it really operates nicely as a lens for interpretation. Uh, and I think it's really important as we move forward as researchers to consider these elements of intersectionality in our data collection, um, because previously a lot of these elements have been overlooked. And here's just my little dig. Uh, despite what certain white male politicians have said, uh, intersectionality is not a kooky academic theory. Um, and a lot of people in power don't like intersectionality because it threatens the patriarchy when we start to think this way, okay? Um, I think it's pretty well understood that breastfeeding is a feminist issue, but what that means is term, in terms of what kind of feminism is really kind of vague. Um, a lot of discussion has happened around gender equality versus gender neutral child rearing. Uh, people get muddied in the waters of uh, how can we be gender, gender equal when we're breastfeeding um, and how can we um, have gender neutral trial, child rearing when the mom is almost solely responsible for feeding the child. So there's been a lot of back and forth discussion, even disagreement around that and conflict among feminist theories. So even within feminists, we see a lot of disagreement about where breastfeeding sits as far as the feminist act. I think breastfeeding can be feminist when we get adequate acknowledgement, recognition and value placed on the work involved with breastfeeding and producing milk. 
And really, we don't have this um, in our society right now. And also, we have to really think about that perception that breastfeeding is constraining women, um, that it might be misplaced, and that the constraints that women experience are actually located in persistent systemic and societal structures of gender inequality. So the fact that we don't recognize and honor the work of a breastfeeding person um, is really the problem and not the actual breastfeeding and the time it takes. One of the big issues that has kind of clouded the whole feminist movement towards breastfeeding um, being accepted uh, as women's work and valued is um, this infant feeding discourse being dominated by white feminism. So historically, I'm not going to go into the history of feminism that much, but really in the first, second, and third waves of feminism, that was white driven by the white privileged female. They were really focusing on issues impacting these privileged women um, and kind of not thinking about those um, that didn't fit within this paradigm. So those who are cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied, uh, this was really promoting rights for these people. And we see now people who embrace this um, ideology or this particular form of feminism may even exhibit some turfism. So trans exclusionary radical feminism um, can come out of some of these groups. So what the big failure here was, we ignored distinct forms of oppression with other groups that were um, either female identifying or sexual or sex based female or um, other underrepresented groups, women of ethnic minorities, uh, people who identified with LGBTQ2S, uh, physical and neurodevelopmental disabilities, and women lacking other privileges. So we've really moved forward to enhance um, the benefits for women who have privilege, but kind of left other people behind. And we have to be aware that most of our scientists and our female scientists were raised under this paradigm where we've um, used the post-positivism um, patriarchal design, maybe sprinkled with a little bit of white feminism. So we have to just be aware that even though we have a lot of women in leadership now, which is amazing, and in healthcare research, we still need to challenge their perceptions of who their work is informing. And when we take this back into the infant feeding space and the promotion of breastfeeding, kind of the same premise um, applies. Now, you're probably familiar with La Leche League International, and this is probably one of our biggest breastfeeding promotion groups in the world. And it was originally started in the United States by uh, a white Christian group of, of mothers that really thought that breastfeeding needed to be promoted. And they have kind of driven the discourse of breastfeeding promotion um, through the United States and into other countries and internationally. So most improvements and interventions to increase breastfeeding rates have historically served privileged white females. Um, there's, and that's because of this predominantly white leadership in the breastfeeding movement. However, we're still seeing significant discrepancies in breastfeeding rates for many equity deserving groups. Um, a good example in the States is um, black infants have significantly lower breastfeeding rates than white infants. Um, and we can see particularly uh, good outcomes when we have interventions that are targeted and built by black breastfeeding mothers who can meet the, the, the needs of their communities. Um, but when we have um, interventions that serve the greater good or the uh, kind of white privilege dominant culture, we don't see those same outcomes happen. One example that is has been shown to work quite well with equity deserving groups is the baby friendly initiative, uh, where we have parameters in place in certain healthcare providing places such as hospitals or clinics that really help to inform breastfeeding. And these baby friendly initiatives have recently received a lot of criticism from lobby groups. But the BFI is one of the most successful interventions to increase black breastfeeding rates in the United States. The people who are complaining tend to be those who are quite privileged and of the dominant culture. So it's really things to think about how is white feminism informing our, our discourse and our understanding of breastfeeding promotion. Uh, some of Kimberly Seals Allaire's work, uh, who is a journalist, but does a lot of work in the black breastfeeding space, 
has really, she's written a nice book called The Big Letdown and really talks about how white women find it difficult not to center themselves and insist on being involved in breastfeeding promotion across the board. So we have feminist tensions that have arisen because of these different discourses. We have that white feminism aspect, and then we have um, the intersectional feminist aspect, which is starting to gain more momentum. And you can see this in recent publications, one by Courtney Young called Lactivism, and then of course this one by Kimberly Seals Allers about the big letdown. Um, they kind of take opposing viewpoints here, but the one thing that they can agree on is that big business has really influenced how we look at infant feeding. And big business has, <clears throat> sorry, co-opted infant feeding. And we've really been informed for the last century in the infant field feeding world by the patriarchy and the C word, and by that I mean capitalism. So commercialization of human milk substitutes or commercial milk formulas has really led to the commodifi commodification of infant feeding. And this has a global reach. We started in um, kind of the Western colonized areas uh, and then as those were saturated with infant feeding um, with commercial formula, commercial formula companies expanded their reach into other areas where um, we've colonized ourselves as Europeans um, and then more into low and middle income countries. And with that came a lot of unethical marketing strategies. And unfortunately, the majority of governments are constrained on how they regulate the marketing of these formula companies. Um, I think they could probably come up with some good methods to regulate it, but again, profit speaks. And these are very, very affluent organizations that have a lot of power. And what they've uh, participated in is very aggressive modes of profit seeking and wealth accumulation. Uh, that comes about through unethical and predatory marketing. I'm not going to get into that because I could talk to you all day about examples of what's happened there. But other strategies they've used um, have been to um, increase perceptions and diagnoses of uh, diet-related illnesses like cow milk protein allergies. They were uh, accused and found guilty of being very heavily of absolute influential, influential in um, convincing doctors that cow milk protein or these protein allergies were a problem and diagnoses skyrocketed uh, because there's special formulas to address that. Another tech, uh, technology, it's not really, um, the method they use is pathologizing normal infant behavior. So crying, not settling, not sleeping through the night. Those are actually normal behaviors, but we've come to pathologize them because they're special infant formulas that can help address them. But we know, uh, and we just published an article on this last week, that those claims are not supported by the evidence. So it is um, really unethical marketing. Now we do see um, trends that have really, really been impacted by certain formula initiatives across the last few decades, but also by certain breastfeeding promotion in initiatives. So it's kind of an ebb and a flow. But it's important to know that formula was developed as a nutritional replacement for breast milk. That was back in the day when we didn't know anything about human milk and we knew these infants needed macronutrients, micronutrients, and calories to grow. So really that was the original intent. It was patent patented um, in the late 1800s in a response to women working outside of the home. And not until 1980 did we actually have any regulations on quality controls, mandate testing, and regulating what was in formula. Uh, as I mentioned, they've really been guilty of aggressive marketing, uh, targeting physicians, hospitals, uh, de developing countries, and then the advertising has really taken up a lot of space as far as um, monies and promotional items. But what it's really led to is the breastfeeding versus formula feeding era. And we're getting a lot into the discourse of fed is best versus breast is best. And I think a lot of this, if we look at the commodification and the value of formula, and the formula industry and compare it to the value or the undervalue of breastfeeding, because we often hear that breastfeeding is free, but really it's not. So formula profits, <clears throat> sorry, over the past, um, oh gosh, that's 40 years now, uh, have grown 37 fold. 
uh, going from about 1.8 billion to 55.6 billion annually. So this is a huge business. Predominantly, we only see about three or fewer companies dominating the market in most countries. And as an example of the spending on advertising, Nestle spends almost 10 billion annually on their advertising. Like that is incredible. There's no way we can even compete with that. And they're really getting very innovative. They're approaching um, micro influencers. So somebody that has five to 10,000 followers on Instagram and giving them free samples to promote their, um, their product. Uh, they've got different kinds of formulas throughout the lifespan, including maternal nutrition and toddler nutrition, really things that aren't required, but convince women and families that they need them. When we compare that to women's care work, um, we can see quite a discrepancy in how undervalued the time and the prod production of breastfeeding is. So women perform about 76% of all unpaid care work, and about three times that of men, probably not a surprise to anybody in the room, and average about seven to 11 hours more care work per week than men. Now, if we put a monetary value on that, it equates to about 25 to 32% of gross domestic, domestic product. But we don't include this in our gross domestic product calculation. Uh, somebody recently did a calculation, an economist, on how much breastfeeding actually costs. And when you look at the product that the, mo the breastfeeding parent is producing and their time, really at $35,000 a year, plus service fees for all the stuff you need to buy, which that's debatable, it comes to about $97,000 per year. Um, so we have to understand that we assume breastfeeding is free, but really that's because we don't place value on the care work that the breastfeeding parent is providing. And again, countries don't value that as well when it comes to the, the bottom line of their gross domestic product and greater formula production and sales do increase the gross domestic product, breastfeeding does not. So you can see the tensions arise around um, the value that um, breastfeeding versus formula provides to society from a commercial or capitalist aspect. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so let's look at some emerging evidence on human milk. Unfortunately, we really have had to rely on the formula industry to provide us with evidence and science about what our bodies produce because they have the money and they have the technology. And because human milk and breast chest feeding research has historically been undervalued by funding agencies who aren't influenced by formula companies, um, we don't have, we're starting to see an increase in those funded research projects, but a lot of the data, all the ev um, and evidence comes predominantly from formula industry. An example is Nestle Nutrition Institute has the world's largest food and nutrition research organization and that produces about 200 research articles per year. I myself have used them because the research that's done in them is really, really well done. It's the highest quality biomedical research you can get. The interpretations maybe are a little sketchy, but when you get into the actual data, it's, it's really well done science but it is censored, or centered in this biomedical nutrient centric um, lens rather than a socially determined interpretation. And we consistently see maternal factors and maternal influences ignored in this space. Um, and it does aim to understand human milk composition in order to replicate it in commercial milk formulas. So that's always something to keep in mind. And just looking at the history of human milk composition research. And what we've seen over the last uh, four decades for publications, you can see that my micronutrients and macronutrients, um, they're starting to pick up as far as what we're looking at with the technologies we have to assess them. But really the exploding area is these bioactives. And we really didn't know these bioactives existed in human breast milk. Uh, until about the early 2000s or really care about them. But as you can see now, very, very popular to be looked at in the research. I'm just gonna take a few minutes to look at these as an example. So examples of bioactives in human milk that we previously ignored because we just thought human milk was a nutritional aspect 
are things like human milk oligosaccharides, milk microbiome, and short-chain fatty acids. So those all inform the infant microbiome. We have several immunological factors that ebb and flow based on maternal infection, based on infant infection. These are really hard to replicate, but they do provide passive and active immunity for the infant. Lots of hormones are present in breast milk, um, both sex hormones and appetite regulating hormones. And then this other section is really fascinating because we are just learning about these and have many unidentified substances, things like ex extracellular vesicles, milk fat, globule membranes, stem cells, microRNAs. And even in a recent systematic review I did, um, items that we did on, they did untargeted metabolomics on and had no name for them. They were just PFJ60, so a molecule that they've not seen before present in human breast milk. They don't know what it does. The important thing to look at is maternal factors do influence these aspects of human milk composition. The human milk composition changes during a feeding episode, during the day as the infant develops over time, and in response to the physical and emotional exchanges between mom and child. So it is a very dynamic fluid and it's informed by many maternal factors such as um, her physical activity, ethnicity, BMI, age, but also there are social factors which really are not incorporated into the research at all. So um, we are still predominantly ignoring the person who produces the milk uh, in science. Uh, and the other thing to be considerate of is that human milk presents a very easily obtained non-invasive biospecimen. So we're moving into the age where they're going to start taking milk and looking at it as um, bioidentifiers for potential diseases, for genetics. Um, so we're in this wild west kind of stage where we have to understand that this product um, may be used hopefully for good, but may have some other uh, considerations for looking at other aspects of health beyond infant and a mom's health themselves. So we really need to move forward being responsible in how we look at human milk, um, incorporating an interactional and intersectional lens so that we can really better understand the aspects that the mom or the person providing the milk can play in that milk uh, production, that milk composition, but also in their own experience with producing it. Now I am here to say that human milk does uh, supersede formula in what it has in it. it it's the, the science, you can't deny it. We have so many aspects of human milk compared to what's in formula. Um, and as we get the technology to understand it from a biomedical standpoint, we see that there are multiple influences on infant health. We don't have a very good understanding of what those all are, but the microbiome is a good example of an area where our understanding of how human milk positively impacts the microbiome and the resultant infant outcomes over the last 20 years has expanded and is really now compelling to show that that is impactful and important to consider. So I think we will continue to see this. Um, and we do have kind of on a greater, more macro look at how human milk impacts infant health outcomes, different levels of strength of evidence on what we have good, we're confident in saying human milk can improve in infant outcomes and what we're less confident in saying. And that weaker aspect, uh, looking at the bottom there of asthma, diabetes and allergies, there's a lot of focus, again, looking from that biomedical model of human milk and how it impacts. So that evidence is improving as well. But there is quite a bit of, um, and I have a slide later that talks about criticisms. So essentially, what we can say is that um, there's a spectrum here of human milk as far as a direct breastfeeding versus pumped milk versus pumped milk that's frozen versus pasteurized donor milk from human milk banks to formula that kind of a good, better, best kind of thing. So, uh, and how they can inform infant health. And when I'm given a disembodied substance of human milk that's been pumped and compare it to formula, I am gonna say as a scientist, as a clinician, yes, human milk is um, the better substance if we can provide it, but it's the, if we can provide it piece. 
So if human milk came out of a faucet, we would ensure it was given to every baby. But human milk comes from humans and humans are extraordinarily complex. And breastfeeding itself is even more complex. It is informed by mom's biology, by the determinants of health, the support that's provided to mom, the culture in which mom is breastfeeding, both from a personal cultural aspect and a broader cultural uh, societal aspect, and also mom's emo emotional and mental health. These are things that we always need to consider when we're working with families who are feeding. And that being said, we have a lot of historical issues with breastfeeding research. So we don't have good evidence um, about the different types of breastfeeding. Um, we used to just ask, are you breastfeeding, yes or no? We wouldn't capture that exclusive breastfeeding, direct breastfeeding. We know now that breast milk has a dose response. So uh, the more you give, the longer you give it, there are elements that uh, can impact med, um, infant health outcomes. We also know that breast milk has that chronobiology piece that it changes within a feed across the day and across lactation stages. As I've mentioned before, we've predominantly ignored maternal factors and maternal well being in infant feeding research. And we know that breast milk is fairly dependent on maternal factors. And the other thing that we're really starting to understand is, and this is really from a social ecological standpoint, is infant risk and vulnerability factors. So are certain infants going to benefit more from, inf from human milk compared to other infants that maybe don't have a lot of vulnerabilities? Um, and that's that layering vulnerabilities piece that we heard Jerry talk about a few sessions ago. So the breastfeeding, the benefits of breastfeeding may increase the more vulnerable a child is. And then the other fallacy that we've seen in human milk research is we really look at one component very reductionist and a lot of these components interact together as does the greater society of the mom feeding in that uh, context. So the popular perception that breast milk is some kind of magical substance that will lead your child to be healthy and brilliant is simply not correct. This is a well quoted piece of work by Emily Oster that we do hear a lot in the human milk research and uh, clinical space. Emily is a PhD in economics, FYI. She's not a scientist per se as far as uh, health sciences, but um, uh, there, this is a common criticism we get that breast milk is highly overstated. And I think it's highly overstated when we get into that greater socio-ecological context. We put so much pressure on moms to breastfeed. Failure to breastfeed uh, makes mothers feel inadequate. Uh, they're, they're at increased risk for maternal depression. And the biggest uh, kind of criticism we get is breastfeeding may be a proxy for socioeconomic advantage of the mother. Again, this is a really good point. And because we haven't properly explored the mom in this equation, we can't adequately address this criticism very well. Um, I'm aware that we're coming close to the hour. So uh, if you have to hop off, it's being recorded. So we need to consider mater maternal experiences with our breastfeeding research. We have to assess factors that incorporate intersectionality as outcomes and potential confounders so that we can address this breastfeeding via proxy issue. And really consider, this goes back to that white feminism piece, the person who's delivering the message um, and the critique of the breastfeeding research and their privilege. Emily Oster is an extraordinarily privileged, well-educated woman, has a following of similar people, and uh, similar criticisms are, can come to the Fed is Best movement as well, that these people um, are in the dominant group. So maybe their babies wouldn't benefit as much from breast milk feeding as people who are equity deserving and whose babies would benefit more. So these are important things to consider. I have been looking for a model like this for years. I was so excited when I found it. So this is kind of the um, law of diminishing returns. So it's a basic economic principle, but what this graph or model looks at is mom's personal investment in infant feeding or breastfeeding and the returns for the infant. Uh, and unfortunately it is infant centric. It's not mom centric. One thing I haven't talked about is that there are elements of breastfeeding that benefit mom from a health perspective. But 
we can see that at some point, the in returns uh, or the benefits to the infant do level out. And this is just a model, so it's different for, ooh, I did something, sorry. Um, this is just a model for one infant, but we can think about when we start to think intersectionality and all those um, intersecting systems of oppression or privilege that we see that certain infants may benefit more and certain infants may benefit less. So that return on in investment for an infant who maybe doesn't have a lot of biological risk factors, has all their needs met, have well-off parents, as opposed to that infant who has a lot more social vulnerabilities, we're gonna see likely, um, and the evidence is starting to support this, but this is where we need to go, is increased, ooh, my fans, oh, that was my other slides that I sent you. <laughs> no, that's okay. Increased benefits for that infant that has more biological and social vulnerabilities. And when I talk about vulnerabilities, I mean, thinking about the determinants of health, like do they have access to health care? Are their parents well-educated? Do they have a safe living environment? Are there social considerations? But the reality is that um, work by mom, that investment um, sometimes doesn't turn out to produce a successful breastfeeding experience. So we know that in Canada, over 90% of mothers initiate breast and chest feeding and over 60% do not meet their breastfeeding goals. And when this happens, moms are faced with feelings of guilt. They're ashamed. They feel like they failed as mothers. Um, some feel like they're stigmatized by other breastfeeding parents or by healthcare professionals. And then we also see that um, there's anger towards the healthcare system when this happens, and they're less likely to go on and try and breastfeed subsequent infants but they also have a negative perception overall of infant feeding and can influence other mothers that they interact with as well. So, and this is one that I found quite profound is lots of moms experience or some moms experience fear of infant health consequences or repercussions when they're forced to feed their child formula. So it's really important when this decision comes about or it's time that a parent needs to supplement that there's lots of reassurance that happens and that you have really good conversations about the formula or the supplement that you're providing. So when we're working with families who are trying to breastfeed or in the infant feeding space, we have to, um, sorry, we have to balance the mother and infant trade-offs. So the benefits of breastfeeding on infant and maternal health versus maternal well-being and their mental health. And at what point do the scales tip? So when we think about this from a clinical perspective or a research perspective, really incorporating that intersectional feminism piece um, and be cognizant that we expect people to breastfeed, but we fully expect them to breastfeed on their own. We as a society, as a healthcare um, group, uh, do not provide a lot of supports for families to go out and breastfeed on their own. It, they really navigate this on their own. One thing that we need to really consider when we're working with breastfeeding families or families who are making infant feeding decisions is that those in decisions are informed decisions and that they're making informed choice around infant feeding and breastfeeding. That means providing them with the evidence um, that you have. Um, and sometimes it's hard to say yes, breast milk is um, a much better substance but they have to make those decisions with the evidence we have. We can't protect moms and be paternalistic and not give them that information. That's not fair. Um, I know lots of parents who've just decided to move over to formula for no really good reason. And a lot of that is situated in the fact that they maybe don't understand and haven't been given the evidence they need to make that um, decision on their own. Maybe it's time for them to have a bit more freedom or what have you, but they're not making those decisions with all the information that they should have. We also have to place more value. And that of ooh, healthy children um, and families. And we also want to think about how that social position fits in. So do we have an infant in front of us who's had lots of vulnerabilities, lots of negative exposures to their microbiome, maybe has um, 
living in a situation where, uh, you know, it's, it's not as safe as an infant that lives in another situation, or maybe food security is an issue. Do these families warrant having increased support around breastfeeding so we can try and make them more successful? <laughs> Solutions should be offered fairly to everyone, but I think we are, could be at the point where we do look at these family specific situations and we do this in donor human milk feeding space a lot, where we have a family that's vulnerable, they can't afford the donor milk, they need to supplement and they get it for free because just that little push may be what they need to get through. So being a pragmatist, I like to talk about problems, but I also like to talk about solutions. So one thing we need to do when we're working with families, this is kind of from a clinical point of view, I have research uh, kind of suggestions as well, is talk to parents about their infant feeding goals. So uh, the World Health Organization, Alberta Health Services, pretty much every healthcare agency in the world says infants should be exclusively breastfed for six months and two years or beyond complementary fed. Those are our goals. Those are not family's goals. So it is really interesting when you sit down with a family and ask them what breastfeeding success means to them. What do you think you need to be successful and what does that success look like? For some, it is exclusive breastfeeding. For some, it's getting a good latch. For some, it's seamless breastfeeding. You don't know until you have that conversation. And the other thing to know is that those goals change as they move along their infant feeding journey. So it's good to touch point with them a lot. The other thing I want to emphasize, and I touched on this before because this is my soapbox, is informed decision-making, evidence-based practice. This is why we need better research in the breastfeeding space because um, it's, it's getting better, but we need that intersectional piece. We need to understand how negative breastfeeding experiences impact women's outcomes, mother uh, breastfeeding parents' outcomes, and infant outcomes, because we know when cortisol is really high and it's a stressful situation or mom has depression, that also negatively impacts infant outcomes. So at what point are we changing our language from that breast is best to breastfeeding is normal? Um, avoiding paternalism and really promoting that informed decision-making. So support and empower families to make the decisions that are best for them, but make sure they have all the information. And the other thing I like to do as a clinician is look at formula as an intervention when things don't go as planned. If you view it as a medication, we all take medications at certain points to help our body function more properly. And I think of formula kind of as a medication, there's risks and benefits. Some hospitals are now bringing in a signed consent for formula so that parents are better supported in making that informed decision. And then really bringing intersectionality into the care you provide. So providing person or mother-centered care. I tried to Google a picture that showed mother-centered care. You think I could find it? It doesn't exist. It is wild. We really like to toss moms out as soon as that baby's born. Sorry, that's another soapbox of mine. So ask the family about their infant feeding goals. Ensure that they're making informed decisions. Consider maternal well-being. Do a maternal assessment when you are doing your infant feeding consultations or having conversations, but avoid paternalism. Okay, we, we're, we're strong. We have, mothers are strong. We can often understand the, the bottom line of things, we don't really need to be protected um, and that paternalism still exists in the infant feeding space. And again, think about your lens. Going back to that first slide about breastfeeding, what is your lens? What is your personal experience um, doing to influence this conversation? And then be intersectional or trauma-informed in your care. So again, looking at that full perspective. And then kind of more on a macro level, what can we do? Uh, lobby for societal changes to better support and protect women's health. Now I have the pre-announcement for the CIHR call that's coming out on women's health. This is foundational. Uh, unfortunately, it is basic science and biomedical based. So we're going to be missing that social aspect. But things from a policy level, protect and maternity leave, we're so privileged in Canada to have this and many countries do. The U.S. does not. Women have to go back to work. Sorry, I'm using women. Uh, mothers, breastfeeding parents have to go back to work at six weeks. How do you support exclusive breastfeeding in that situation? 
be critical of deeply embedded gender bias that is present in capitalism, in healthcare, in our societal norms. We as white privileged women, we need to speak up. We need to unpack our own privilege uh, as clinicians, as supporters, as breastfeeding or infant feeding allies. Learn what it is to be an ally and help other white women to do the same. Really prioritize women's health research as a priority. I think that's why many of us are here and include all the socio-ecological elements in your, as many as you can with feasibility being um, considered as aspects and outcomes in your research. And just, I'm gonna end it here, um, being intersectional um, in your own research. We need to think about the knowledge we have right now, but also construct new knowledge that is built from a feminist perspective, centering women, um, and vulnerable individuals around that because we know most of our knowledge in healthcare and many other places are centered around the white male. Um, grounding your research in feminist values and beliefs that includes using that throughout the research process, focusing on meaning for women, um, recognizing that research is still con conducted within existing structures that are informed by the patriarchy and also by colonialism as well. Uh, really try to make your research more diverse. So not Unitarian in the discipline that you're working with, but using interdisciplinary uh, considerations, different methodologies. I'm a big proponent of using mixed methods in breastfeeding and human milk feeding research. Um, and constantly kind of moving that goal and redefining uh, what you're looking at based on evidence that we're gaining using these new paradigms, but also emerging concerns for women and minorities, because these do change. And then addressing issues of oppression, um, looking at anti-racism, looking at diversity, um, equitable decision-making, and trying to empower women and equity-deserving groups as much as you can in your research. Um, I do have a few more slides, but I think we can end it there. They're just self-promotion slides about donor milk. <laughs> so there is one thing I think we are missing right now is when it's time to supplement an infant and the healthcare provider has made that decision. as a choice. And now more and more donor human milk is becoming accessible to families um, that aren't in the NICU or neonatal intensive care unit setting. So what I'm looking at is bringing donor milk in as a choice for families who need to supplement in the postpartum unit. Um, and they, they get the opportunity to choose eventually. We have a couple of different studies going on. Right now at the foothills, parents are given the option to choose. Obviously from a scientific standpoint, we're gonna have bias samples if I look at outcomes. So we're really exploring that experience of choice. And what does that do for maternal agency? Um, what does that do for trying to get to it here? Maternal well-being when they're given that choice of donor milk formula to, um, to supplement their infant. Do they feel better? Do they have less anger? Uh, things like that. We're also looking at um, the actual health outcomes of donor human milk supplementation as opposed to formula supplementation in a much more rigid structure. So choice isn't involved here, it's a randomized controlled trial, but we're looking at clinical health outcomes there in the microbiome. Um, and as I get more funding and more momentum, then we'll look at neurodevelopment, we'll look at infections, we'll look at metabolic um, and allergy and asthma. So kind of multifaceted, still kind of looking at that biomedical model, but I'm really, really interested to see what giving choice and agency does for maternal well-being at week one, at week six. We are looking at um, measures for mothers who are in the randomized control trial. As far as anger, we have an anger scale and a depression scale to see, you know, are we going to see group differences between the two? We don't know, but it's really neat to include mothers in that um, aspect. So where are we here? Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much. Um, at this mm -hmm. point, yeah, so uh, let us know if you have any questions either in the chat. I'm going to stop the recording because generally uh, for us, we don't record our uh, question and answer period. Uh, and thank you so much for hanging on and for uh, dealing with our um, technical difficulties today. All right, so I'm going to try and find. I only went 10 minutes over. It's not bad. Okay, good. Yeah, no, we're good. We're good.